Okay, we should be live and hopefully people can hear me. Yeah, do you have your phone with you or anything? Check and see. Well, I, sometimes we forget our phones. <laughs> yeah. I'm here too, Karen. Did could you hear me talking on the Can you hear me talking on the live stream? Okay, good. Yep. And we are using a brand new and different camera this morning. Uh, and I have it set up in such a way that it is recording. So if the live stream does drop, this is being recorded. It will go up on the internet later. Uh, so I have that figured out probably, probably. It's, it's a new camera. Um, we talked about it, I think, at, at the voters meeting that I wasn't at, but we, we talked about it. And I went ahead and, and got it. So hopefully it works out for us. Uh, if not, we'll return it and try something else. So. But hopefully you can both see and hear me right now. I don't have my iPad with me, so I can't check. But faith check, internet seems to work. We'll make it through. Good morning, good morning. Good morning. Here, I'll take off the microphone for a second so I'm not so close to it. I don't know, are we going to get some rain today? Oh, yeah, I'm hoping I get some, some rain today. I see that the wind is starting to get up. Oh, really? It's starting to blow. Okay. give everyone just a, another minute to hop in here. It is 9.30, but we'll see if there's any stragglers coming in in person. I do apologize for the disruption to Bible study last week. Um, those of you who are here, um, after the live stream's over, I'll kind of explain what's going on with that because it is likely uh, that that will happen again, and there's a specific reason for that. So um, after Bible study's over, I'll turn off the live stream and we can talk about why I wasn't here last week. Uh, and if you are here in person, you put the microphone on. If you aren't here in person, you may hear uh, a baby cry. Um, and that's because I'm working through some things. And the cries are coming from here. Uh, not really. Uh, Gideon is back there. I can see him, but you can't. Uh, so if you do hear baby cries, I do apologize for that. We'll, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Oh, yeah? Oh, 
Oh, 760 and 736. Yeah. Isn't that consider how the bird's above? Is that? Yeah. Yep. Yep. And that's a, that's a Missouri Synod original. Stephen Starkey is a Missouri Synod pastor. Um, but I like have no fear, little flock. And I, oh, and last Mike means 734. I trust, O Lord, your holy name. That, maybe, maybe he means that one. Uh, if you look at that one, we can blame it on Mike. Yeah. And then 760, that was the hymn of the day. So we're going to sing that. Uh, now, on Sunday, we get, um, what are we going to get on Sunday? Oh, we get a nice long one on Sunday. 750. Uh, if thou but trust in God to guide thee, and it's going to be the closing, no, it's not that one. Uh, what is the closing hymn on Sunday? 741, that's the right one. Jesus Christ, my sure defense. We're going to sing that on Sunday as the closing hymn, and we're going to do all eight. We're doing all eight. <laughs> we're doing all eight. Well, because I'm going to preach on the, well, so the Old Testament text and the New Testament text both have to do with, with resurrection. The Old Testament text is that widow at Zarephath we heard about last week. Her son dies uh, and then is raised to life. And the gospel reading is Jesus raising that young man in name. Uh, and so I'm going to talk about death and how we're all going to die, uh, but then we're going to rise again. So uh, the hymn makes sense. So we're going to sing eight stanzas, and if that particular hymn, if you take off the last four, that's a bad idea. Don't do that. <laughs> you know, some, some hymns you can squeak by taking out stanzas, but other ones, it's just not going to work. Well, seeing as how uh, we are here and we are past our start time, let's go ahead and begin with a word of prayer. The gospel reading on Sunday, and I apologize for uh, my not being here, but uh, we had a, a fill-in pastor who I understand did an excellent job. Uh, so we are thankful for Pastor Bomer for being here with us on Sunday. The gospel reading, however, uh, was Jesus talking about how uh, he will care for us, how we need not worry. Uh, if he feeds the birds of the heavens and clothes the lilies of the field, uh, he will take care of us as well. Uh, and we'll hear this in this prayer. So this is the prayer for the 15th Sunday after Trinity. So let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for all your benefits in giving us life and limb and graciously sustaining them until now. And we beseech you not to take away your blessing from us, but keep us from covetousness, that we may serve you alone, love you, and cling to you, and not sin by idolatry and the harmful worship of mammon, but put all our hope, comfort, and confidence only in your mercy and grace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And actually that goes well because in confirmation, in the upper classes, we're starting on the first commandment, which teaches us uh, to fear, love, and trust in God above all things. Uh, so that prayer in that reading actually goes well with that. Now, where did we leave off? We finished the article on the Mass. We finished the article on confession. Did we do? All right. Good. Is that where we were at? We started last time at that? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, we're in the Augsburg Confession, Article 26, which is on the distinction of meats, is the title, Paragraph 8. Uh, so, let's find uh, some page numbers here. All right, if you are in the Kolb Wangert, page 77. If you are in the reader's edition, let's see if we can find that page. 60, 61 or so? 60, no, 51, excuse me, 51, unless you have Laura's edition and the page numbers are a little bit different on that. Uh, in mine, I have the Augsburg Confession, the Apology, and some other cool stuff all combined, so I won't even tell you my page numbers here. Uh, but we will continue then 
on this distinction of meats. And to backtrack a little bit, this isn't totally about meat, right? So the, those of us who are familiar with Roman Catholics now, uh, we are familiar with their practice during certain times of the year uh, to not eat meat on Fridays, or at least during one time of the year. Uh, if you know any friends in one of the Orthodox churches, uh, they'll go the whole Lent without eating meat. So they don't just do the Fridays, they do the whole Lent. Uh, or there are other holy days where there's an obligation to, to not eat meat, right? And this article is about, are these things cool? You know, are we cool with this idea that the church may set traditions that must be observed, you know, particularly to, to merit grace or to merit the forgiveness of sins? Uh, are we cool with that? And, you know, and you'll see it's not just about meat, but about other things. Uh, so let's go to paragraph four. We'll back up a little bit because there's a few points that they're making in this article. And the first point is in paragraph four. It says, First, the chief part of the gospel, the doctrine of grace and of the righteousness of faith, has been obscured by this view. The gospel should stand out as the most prominent teaching in the church in order that Christ's merit may be well known and faith, which believes that sins are forgiven for Christ's sake, be exalted far above works. Therefore, Paul also lays the greatest stress on this article, putting aside the law and human traditions in order to show that Christian righteousness is something other than such works. Christian righteousness is the faith that believes that sins are freely forgiven for Christ's sake. But this doctrine of Paul has been almost completely smothered by traditions, which have produced the opinion that we must merit grace and righteousness by making distinctions in meats and similar services. When repentance was taught, there was no mention made of faith. Only works of satisfaction were set forth, and so, repentance seemed to stand entirely on these works. So our first beef with this, this topic uh, is that in the church, the doctrine of Christ's righteousness through faith of his work for us should be, well, that should be the beef. That should be what the church is about. Uh, but what happened is these distinctions and these works come up and people began to be taught or to, to perceive that righteousness was not by faith, but by observing these works. And, and then they said when, when faith was talked about and when repentance was talked about, people weren't directed to Christ. They were directed to these works. Right? And so what happens is the, the doctrine of Christ, of his work for us, that, that drops. You know, and so that's, that's our first big problem with these, these distinctions and these traditions. But now we get to paragraph 8. It says, Second, these traditions have hindered God's commandments because traditions were placed far above God's commandments. Christianity was thought to stand wholly on the observance of certain holy days, rites, fasts, and vestments. These observances won the exalted title of the spiritual life and the perfect life. Meanwhile, God's commandments, according to each one's vocation or calling, were without honor. These works include a father raising his children, a mother bearing children, a prince governing the commonwealth. These were considered to be worldly, and thus imperfect works, far below the glittering observances of the church. This error greatly tormented people with devout consciences. They grieved that they were held in an imperfect state of life, as in marriage, in the office of a ruler, or in other civil services. They admired the monks and others like them. They falsely thought that these people's observances were more acceptable to God. Now, is that something that only happens in the past? You know, for those of us who are maybe familiar with 
with some people in another large church body. Is this something that is still going on, you think? I don't know. I mean, we have a couple among us that have spent some time in that, that church body. Um, I can pull this out here, and I was actually reading it this morning, because one of the articles is going to be on monastic vows. And this talks about how uh, in the consecrated life, one can more nearly and more perfectly follow Christ as opposed to, you know, living lives that we live now, right? Uh, and it says that. It's, it's in, pretty fun to read, big, heavy. But they say that. Uh, and so they say the f second problem we have with these traditions that the church imposes, that, you know, beyond the fact that people are taught that these merit righteousness and grace and forgiveness, uh, then people take from them that their works of being a faithful husband and father, of being a good ruler, uh, which are done according to the commandments, these are not as good as the commandments of the church, is kind of what people perceive. You know, so the people who are living the holy life, who are living lives pleasing to God, are those who go off into the monastery or who take vows of poverty and, and not a faithful Christian mother who prays for her children. You know, in observance of the first commandment and the fourth commandment, at least. Uh, you know, so people were then driven to despair over this, you know, as we'll find, uh, that they could not live a life pleasing to God. You know, since they were not given to the religious life. Instead, we see here the doctrine of vocation. And if you're in the Missouri Synod, you probably recognize that, that phrase, the doctrine of vocation, because we talk about this a lot, that the life that is pleasing to God is not necessarily the life of a pastor or a monk or a priest or whatever. Uh, but if you are a faithful Christian parent, God be praised. You know, uh, if you pray for your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, that is pleasing to God. Uh, if you are a child and you listen to your parents because that's what God's will for your life is, that's great. You know, the Christian righteousness does not exist in doing good works, but in faith, which then, then leads to these works. And so our second beef with these distinction of meats is that not only are people taught to merit righteousness by these things, but then they're taught that these things are better than the commandments. You know, and we actually encountered this when we talked about the marriage of priests. Uh, or, uh, and we'll get this when we talk about monastic vows in just a little bit, where uh, there were priests who were married that the bishops broke their marriages. Or there were people who uh, were married and left to go into the monastery or, or into the convent, leaving their spouses behind because they thought that that life was more holy than the married life. And th this happened in the past. I don't know if it still happens now. I think uh, that would be much frowned upon now, uh, but it did happen. Right? Uh, and so our second issue with this is that these traditions of the church, these laws of the church, they were instituted and then they end up taking the place of God's commandments. Right? Uh, so let's keep going. Paragraph 12. Third, traditions brought great danger to consciences. It was impossible to keep all traditions, and yet people considered these observances to be necessary acts of worship. Gerson, uh, and, and Gerson was a Roman Catholic theologian who was a professor at Paris. And they, he lived about 100 years before, before this. Garrison writes that many fell into despair and that some even took their own lives because they felt that they were not able to satisfy the traditions. Right? Uh, some of you have related to me relatives who uh, on their deathbeds uh, are greatly afraid you know, of what's going to happen because they have not, you know, lived a life of good works, that they uh, have not received the Mass as often as they should or things like that, uh, and their conscience is harmed. Uh, they're, they're afraid to die uh, and to be with Christ. Uh, and here the Reformers continue on that train that these, these traditions of the Church, not only uh, do they obscure the merit of Christ, uh, not only do they attempt to undo the commandments, but then 
they burden consciences because nobody's able to do them all. And some people have been so filled with despair that they've taken their own lives over this. All the while, says, they had never heard about the consoling righteousness of faith and grace. We see that the academics and theologians gather the tradi traditions and seek ways to relieve and ease consciences. They do not free consciences enough, but sometimes entangle them even more. Right? So they say, so the academics and the theologians, the professors, they're aware of this, and they're trying to cut down on these traditions and these observances, but they don't do it enough, and in some cases, they make it even worse. The schools and sermons have been so occupied with gathering these traditions that they do not even have enough leisure time to touch on Scripture, right? Uh, that they talk so much about traditions and observances that you know, they don't even have free time to talk about the Bible. They do not pursue the far more useful doctrine of faith, the cross, hope, the dignity of secular affairs, and consolation for severely tested consciences. Therefore, Gerson, who was a Roman Catholic, and some other theologians have complained sadly that because of all this striving after traditions, they were prevented from giving attention to a better kind of doctrine. Augustine, there's that name again, forbids that people's consciences should be burdened. He prudently advises Genarius that he must know that they are to be observed as things neither commanded by God nor forbidden, for such are his words. So here they call upon two parties that would be held in esteem in the Roman Catholic Church, again, to say, what we're teaching, it's not new stuff. You know, the Lutherans are not trying to start a new church. They're not trying to introduce new teachings. They're just trying to peel away the corruptions that have come up. And they said, even 100 years ago, uh, the Garrison, professor at Paris, he commented that this stuff was bad. And if you go back 1,000 years before that, Augustine said that church traditions, which are neither commanded by God nor forbidden, you know, these are what we would say adiaphora things that are neither commanded nor forbidden by God, such as um, you're not supposed to bring coffee into the sanctuary. He said sipping. Uh, that's all the offer. Or uh, with COVID, we've been collecting the offering at the door, both here and in Fairbank, and, and not during the service like we normally would like to. You know, and we have mixed feelings about that, understandably so. But you know, is it a commandment from God that we must collect the offering after the sermon and before the service of the sacrament? Not so much. That would be an Audi offer. Something that would not be an Audi offer would be uh, the sermon, for example. You know, uh, that would not be an Audi offer. Uh, or that we uh, close communion. That we only commune those uh, who have been uh, examined and absolved, uh, who are united with us in the faith, uh, that is not audi offera, not even in 2020. Right? Uh, so that thing. But things like uh, we have green pyramids. Uh, I was at a church on Sunday that did not have green. They had white. I think they have white all the time. I think that's what I'm figuring out. Uh, audi offera. You know. Uh, when I was in North Dakota, I had, an, I had a nursing home service every Wednesday, and they didn't have pyramids. Uh, they, they just had white on the altars all the time. That was okay. Hmm. All right, let's continue. Therefore, paragraph 18. Our teachers must not be regarded as having taken up this matter rashly or from hatred of the bishops, as some falsely suspect. There was a great need to warn the churches of these errors that arose from misunderstanding the traditions. The gospel compels us to insist on the doctrine of grace and the righteousness of faith in the churches. This cannot be understood if people think that they merit grace by observances of their own choice. So our churches had taught 
and that we cannot merit grace or be justified by observing human traditions. We must not think that such observances are necessary acts of worship. Here we add testimonies of Scripture. Christ defends the apostles who have not observed the usual tradition, Matthew 15. This had to do with a matter that was not unlawful, but rather neither commanded or forbidden. It was similar to the purifications of the law. He said in Matthew 15, In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Therefore, he does not require a useless human service. Shortly after, he adds, It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a person. So also Paul, in Romans 14, The kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And in Colossians 2, Let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a Sabbath. And again, If with Christ you die to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Peter says, Why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. Here, Peter forbids burdening consciences with many rights, either from Moses or others. In 1 Timothy 4, Paul calls the prohibition of meats a teaching of demons. It is contrary to the gospel to institute or do such works thinking that we merit grace through them, or as though Christianity could not exist without such service of God. So, Here's this topic of works righteousness that comes up again and again and again, and and that's what's coming up here again, is that these traditions instituted by the church, they, they were instituted and people were taught to observe these things rather than the commandments of God, uh, so that by these things they would merit grace. Uh, and any talk of that nature, Uh, we would say, let it be anathema, let it be cursed. Uh, Any idea that we can merit grace or forgiveness or earn righteousness by anything that we do, whatever it may be, get rid of that. Now, here's the flip side. 30. Our adversaries object by accusing our teachers of being against discipline and the subduing of the flesh. Right? So that's the counter charge is, oh, you Lutherans are against discipline. You guys all do everything your body desires and you pay no attention to the commandments. You have no discipline, bodily discipline at all. And that's a false charge. It says, just the opposite is true, as can be learned from our teacher's writings. They have always taught that Christians are to bear the cross by enduring afflictions. This is genuine and sincere subduing of the flesh to be crucified with Christ through various afflictions. Furthermore, they teach that every Christian ought to train and subdue himself with bodily restraints or bodily exercises and labors. Then neither overindulgence nor laziness may tempt him to sin. But they do not teach that we may merit grace or make satisfaction for sins by such exercises. Such outward discipline ought to be taught at all times, not only on a few set days. Christ commands, watch yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness. Also in Matthew 17, this kind never comes out except by prayer and fasting. Paul also says, I discipline my body and keep it under control. Here he clearly shows that he was keeping his body under control, not to merit forgiveness of sins by that discipline, but to keep his body in subjection and prepared for spiritual things, for carrying out the duties of his calling. Therefore, we do not condemn fasting in itself, 
but the traditions that require certain days and certain meats with peril of conscience, as though such works were a necessary service. So there you have it in a nutshell. We're not against fasting. We're not against bodily discipline, bodily discipline. In fact, we should all be exercising bodily discipline, for example, on Sunday morning by getting up and going to church, right? You know, that takes some training of the body, especially uh, in my house, which we now have a baby who uh, may or may not cooperate uh, the night before, right? Uh, but that's part of our Christian discipline or during Advent and Lent, taking an hour on Wednesday evening to go to an extra church service. Why? Why not? <laughs> you know, why not? But it's part of our Christian discipline. We're not against that. And we're not against fasting, for example. If somebody wants to fast, don't tell me about it. You know, if you want to forgo a mealtime so that you can uh, pray 10 psalms, do it, but then don't tell me about it. You know, we're not, you know, that's not what fasting is about. Right? We're not against that. We are against the idea that, that such fasting or such bodily discipline gets you forgiveness. We are against that. You know, period. We're against that. Right? So, you know, eat meat on Fridays if you feel like it. If you don't want to eat meat on Fridays, don't. Don't think that you're going to get forgiveness by doing that. You know, don't even tell me about it because then I'll probably ask you why, and then you'll say because uh, I merit forgiveness, and I'll say, Ugh. Don't do that. Uh, you know, there's all sorts of different forms of bodily discipline that you can or, or can't do. Uh, some people uh, turn off the TV. You know, you recognize what the, the TV and the news as of late, uh, left unchecked, it'll kill your soul. It'll make you depressed and all these things. Turn it off. Don't think that you're going to be forgiven your sins by turning it off. Just turn it off, you know. Um, the radio, you know, there used to be the radio was the source, you know. Some of us lived through Beatlemania, you know, and the corruption of the youth, right? Oh, how times have changed, right? Uh, but don't think you're getting forgiveness by turning it off. Just do it. Bodily discipline is good. And, and I like this point here, that Christians are taught to bear the cross by enduring afflictions, right? And when we, when we hear that passage about Take up your cross and follow me. We, all, we always think about some extra work that we're going to do to pick up our cross and follow Christ. But I wonder if the right interpretation and the interpretation here is uh, the way that we follow Christ and take up our cross is by suffering patiently. Not that we're masochists, uh, but the way that we take up our cross and follow Christ is, is by suffering and patience. You know, and, and when something bad happens or some affliction befalls us, uh, we recognize that this is the due penalty of, of sin, uh, but that we have one who has rescued us from it, you know, who will bring us through this affliction and all afflictions until such time as we are in, in resurrection. Right? That's what it means to take up your cross and follow Christ, according to this. It doesn't mean to do some extra work. It means be patient and have faith. Because, you know, Christ suffered, you know, why shouldn't we? You know, it doesn't mean we go looking for it, of course, right? Um, you know, I think about, like, Peter, right? You know, they, they go to crucify Peter, and uh, the Peter, and he's like, no, wait, put me upside down. You know, he doesn't say, no, don't crucify me. He says, all right, let's do this, but put me upside down, because Jesus got to be crucified right side up. You know, I'm not Jesus, you know? Or like, uh, like Polycarp. Um, so I've been reading through some of the church fathers. And, and so there's the Apostle John. And then the Apostle John taught Polycarp. And then Polycarp taught Irenaeus. And I'll talk about Irenaeus in a little bit. Uh, so Polycarp knew the Apostle John. Uh, and he was 86 years old when they came to, to martyrdom. Uh, and they offered him all sorts of chances to, to recant. Uh, and he says... Uh, you know, for 86 years, I've served the Lord, and he's done me no wrong. How could I now deny him? 
Uh, and so then they, they build this, this fire to, to throw uh, Polycarp on. And uh, when they did this, normally they would, they would nail people down to the, to the pile of wood because otherwise they'd get up and run away from the fire. And Polycarp said, you don't need to do that. I'll stay here. And then he did. You know, he went on and just laid there. And uh, that's how he died. You can read about it. It's pretty cool. Um, but anyway, but he recognized you know, that, that Christian righteousness is not found in, in good works or in, in super works, but uh, by faith in Christ. And sometimes taking up the cross means not doing something extra special, but bearing the cross that has already been laid upon you. Right? Uh, and now in 2020, you know, I think maybe the cross has already been laid upon us. You know, we have, we have COVID, uh, but now, uh, now we get the Supreme Court fund that's going to come up here, uh, and, the po- you know, and the political games are going to come up very quickly, and I expect that our Christian faith is going to be coming up uh, you know, in the news in one way or another. Uh, and when that happens, they're going to be talking about all Christians. right? So in some ways, that's going to be a cross we have to bear for better or for worse pretty soon here. Anyway, we continue. Paragraph 40. Nevertheless, we keep many traditions that are good, that are leading to good order, uh, such as the order of scripture lessons in the mass and the chief holy days. Right? So they say, well, furthermore, we keep the traditions that are good. We're not against that. We have Old Testament and gospel readings and epistle readings and you know, we have Pentecost, for example, as I've been teaching the kids about in Confirmation. Uh, at the same time, we warn people that such observances do not justify us before God, and that it's not sinful if we omit such things without causing offense. The fathers knew of such freedom in human ceremonies. In the East, they kept Easter at another time than at Rome. When the Romans accused the Eastern Church of schism, they were told by others that such practices do not need to be the same everywhere. Irenaeus says, diversity concerning fasting does not destroy the harmony of faith. Pope Gregory says that such diversity does not violate the unity of the church. In the Tripartite History, Book 9, many examples of different rites are gathered. And the following statement is made. It was not the mind of the apostles to enact rules concerning holy days, but to preach godliness and a holy life. Right? So Irenaeus is mentioned here. So the apostle John taught Polycarp. Well, there's there's another guy in there too. Uh, Then Polycarp taught Irenaeus. So Irenaeus is like the third from John. And what happened is there's a big controversy so you've heard of Passover, right? You know, you know Passover in the Old Testament. Uh, that's in Exodus when the angel of death passes over. Uh, the firstborn of Israel is spared because they have the blood on the door. And every year in the Hebrew calendar on 14 Nisan, that's the Passover, right? And it might fall on a Sunday. It might fall on a Tuesday. It might fall on a Friday. Because it goes by the moon, not by the sun. It goes by the moon. So the Hebrew calendar shifts. And the Eastern Christians said, well, well, Christ was crucified on the Passover, which is 14 Nisan. Uh, we're going to celebrate Easter on that. We're going to celebrate Easter on 14 Nisan. And we're going to do that every year, whether it's a Thursday or a Tuesday or a Sunday. We're going to celebrate Easter on wh- whatever day of the week it falls because. because. Uh, and what happened is the church in Rome, uh, poked by a guy named v- Victor, uh, said, Use Eastern guys, you better celebrate Easter on Sunday or else. And they said, what difference does it make? We're celebrating Easter. We believe in Christ's resurrection. What difference does it make if we do it on Wednesday or, or on Sunday? Who cares? And the Pope said, you guys are excommunicated. You're done. You're not, you're not part of the church anymore. Uh, and Irenaeus was the one uh, who went between uh, and said, you know, uh, that's not really how this works. You know, that, that diversity in when you celebrate Easter does not make these people not Christian, right? Uh, so, for example, uh, we probably mark this around Christmas time. I grew up in the Twin Cities where there are a number of, of Orthodox churches, 
Uh, and we would have Christmas, you know, December 24th, 25th. And then, you know, like a week later, the Orthodox churches in the Twin Cities, they would have Christmas because they're operating on a different calendar. Does that make them not Christians? No. See, it's cool. You can celebrate Christmas twice. Like if you're a Lutheran married to an Orthodox, I don't know. Yeah, you get twice as many Christmases. I wouldn't want to pay for that. Uh, <laughs> but that's what Irene Irenaeus said. So uh, there are, you know, churches that don't use the liturgy. Does that mean that they aren't Christian? No. Should they use the liturgy? Yeah. Does that make them not Christian? No. There are churches that don't have vestments or pyramids. Does that make them not Christians? No. Uh, should they use it? Well, they're good. They're good for order. You know, we can see that we're in the time of the church, green, right? Uh, but does that make you not a Christian if you don't have pyramids at your church? No. Right? And this has always been the case, the Lutherans say. So, like, we're not against fasting, properly understood, and we're not against traditions, properly understood. Uh, we are against teaching that these things merit forgiveness, righteousness, grace, any of that works righteous kind of stuff. That's what we're against. All right. Finally made it through that one. Okay. Now we need to talk about monastic vows, everybody's favorite topic. See, I like the reader's edition because then, do you guys get a nice picture here? Somewhere around here of George Margrave of Brandenburg. You guys don't have that picture? You have that picture. Becky doesn't get to have that picture. Yeah, on the next page. And it's a fun note. It says, yeah, so this guy is a politician, not a pastor, not a theologian, just a regular old Christian. A uh, courageous ally of John the Steadfast stood up to the emperor at the Diet of Augsburg, telling Charles that he would sooner have his head cut off than deny Christ and his word, called George the Pious. If you've seen the handsome Luther movie, uh, you see what they do at the end there. And uh, the emperor's like, you will submit. And then he's like, we will not submit. And then they you know, bow down and do that. Uh, I think in history, the way that really happened is the Lutherans got to Augsburg. And on June 28th, there was supposed to be the Corpus Christi Parade, where they take a consecrated host and they parade around the town. And the emperor was like, you guys are going to be in that parade. And this guy was like, that was the occasion that he said that. He said, I'm not doing it. So, interesting. But that's, I think that in history, that's actually where that happened. All right. Anybody want to read the note? You won't be on microphone, but I'll drink my coffee. So again, works righteousness, again, right? That, that's what this is all about. And you can see how this connects to the previous article, right? Uh, and you see how hard the devil and the old Adam work. That we're in article 27, and works righteousness has come up about in 27 of the article. And you see how hard the devil militates against faith in Christ because either salvation is by faith in Christ and not by our works 
or it's by works and not by faith. One of these is what the Bible teaches and one isn't. And you see how many different approaches the devil takes. You know, it's like whack-a-mole. And this happens even in the Lutheran church. We're susceptible to this, you know. Uh, and we live in a world where this is the common sentiment that people who are good go to heaven, people who do bad go to hell. Doesn't matter what God you believe in. Doesn't matter what church you go to or if you go to church. If you do good, you go to heaven. If you do bad, you go to hell. What is that? Well, that's what's righteousness. You know, along with some other things, right? Uh, and part of this then is this monasticism, you know, where people were taught that uh, to live a more holy and, and perfect life, a, a nearer life to the life of Christ, you need to remove yourself from social life and, and into the monastery or into the convent, that it is there that you can live a truly Christian life, right? And uh, in the Missouri Synod, I've encountered this most often, uh, you know, with uh, the seminaries. You know, when you're at seminary, you get to go to chapel, you know, three or four times a day. You're surrounded by other Christians, you know, other Lutheran Christians, and, and life is great. You know, you get to drink beer uh, with other Christians and things like that. And all you want to do is be there. When if everybody just stayed there, then who would be out in the churches? You know. and, and there are some, I will say, some people who do seek to return to be close to the seminary or, or areas that have large concentrations of Missouri Synod Lutherans, you know, rather than being where they are. You know. uh, and so we are against that idea. Paragraph one. It will be easier to understand what we teach about monastic vows by considering the state of the monasteries and how many things were done in every day contrary to canon law. In Augustine's time, they were free associations. Later, when discipline was corrupted, vows were added for the purpose of restoring discipline, as in a carefully planned prison. Yeah, so they say, Back when Augustine was around, you know, if somebody wanted to go to the monastery, all right. If they wanted to leave, fine. You know, it was a free association. Do what you want, you know. But then what happened is, this is going to be crass, uh, but you'll get my, my assertion. And they kind of became frat houses, right? Uh, and so vows were introduced, you know, towards certain behavior. It says, gradually, many other regulations were added besides vows. These binding rules were laid upon many before the lawful age, contrary to canon law. So they say, and then what happened is sometimes people were made to take these vows before they were even legally old enough to do that. Many entered monastic life through ignorance. They were not able to judge their own strength, though they were old enough. They were trapped and compelled to remain, even though some could have been freed by the kind provision of canon law. This was the case more the case in convents of women than of monks, although more consideration should have been shown the weaker sex. This rigor displeased many good people before this time, who saw that young men and women were thrown into convents for a living. They saw what unfortunate result came of this procedure, how it created scandals, and what snares were cast upon consciences. They were sad that the authority of canon law in so great a matter was utterly set aside and despised. In addition to all these evil things, a view of vows was added that displeased even the more considerate monks. They taught that monastic vows were equal to baptism. They taught that a monastic life merited forgiveness of sins and justification before God. Yes, they even added that the monastic life not only merited righteousness before God, but even greater merit since it was said that the monastic life not only kept God's basic law, but also the so-called evangelical councils, right? And the evangelical councils are chastity, poverty, charity. I forget if there's another one in there or not. Um, but it's taught in a certain church based in Rome that there's the Ten Commandments, and above this, then, there are these evangelical counsels that if you really want to live like Christ, 
above the Ten Commandments, then you'll have these things that you'll do. And these are what the monks do, the monks and the nuns. They don't just keep the Ten Commandments like us regular plebes. They keep the evangelical councils too because the Ten Commandments, those are easy for them. Right? Those, you know, they need some more work to do. Right? Uh, so we say, you know, monasticism has turned into this great big ball of hurt. And they say that, that people were introduced to monasticism out of ignorance. They didn't, they didn't realize kind of what they were getting into. Uh, or uh, it's certain times in the Middle Ages, and this is particularly true with girls, they were sent off to the convent because their parents couldn't feed them or whatever. Or in some cases, sent off to the convent to merit righteousness to cover the sins of their parents. Some of the case. Uh, you know, so they were sent off to be provided for, um, you know, and this resulted in a lot of problems. Because when you go into the convent or you go into a monastery, you take vows of, of chastity, uh, and if somebody has not received that gift, that causes problems eventually, right? Uh, and canon law, the Lutherans say, even in these cases, canon law should allow for these people who were introduced to monasticism against their will to be released. But instead, we haven't done anything. And it just gets more evil and worse. 13. So they made people believe that the profession of monasticism was far better than baptism, and that the monastic life was more meritorious than that of rulers, pastors, and others who serve in their calling according to God's commands without any man-made services. None of these things can be denied. This is all found in their own books about monasticism. right? So in addition to all these weird things going on in the monasteries, then this idea came, works righteousness, that monasticism and vows are better than regular life, right? And the Lutherans say, we're not making this up. You can go read their books. It's, it's, it's right there. You know, this is not stuff we're just making up. They talk about this, that monastic life is better than your know, ordinary life. Being a monk is better than being a father, or, you know, an actual father, not a priest father. So, and you, not all priests are monks, or not priests are not monks, and not mo monks are not all priests, but some monks are priests. We'll talk about that sometime. I wrote a paper on it once. And that makes sense. Priests and monks are two different things. There are some monks who are also priests, but not all. So we can talk about that, that sometime. Paragraph 15. How did all this come about in monasteries? At one time, they were schools of theology and other branches of learning, producing pastors and bishops for the benefit of the church. So at one time, these things were good. Now it is another thing. It is needless to go over what everyone knows before they came together for the sake of learning. Now they claim that monasticism is a lifestyle instituted to merit grace and righteousness. They even preach that it is a state of perfection. They put monasticism far above all other kinds of life ordained by God. We have mentioned all these things without hateful exaggeration so that our teacher's doctrine on monasticism may be better understood. First, concerning monks who marry, our teachers say, well, Luther was one, by the way, our teachers say that it is lawful for anyone who is not suited for the single life to enter into marriage. Monastic vows cannot destroy what God has commanded and ordained. God's commandment is this. Because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife. It is not just a command given by God. God has created and ordained marriage for those who are not given an exception to the natural order by God's special work. This is what is taught according to the text in Genesis 2. It is not good that the man should be alone. Therefore, those who obey this command and ordinance of God do not sin. What objection can be raised to this? Let people praise the obligation of a monastic vow as much as they want but they will never be able to destroy God's commandment by means of a monastic vow. 
canon law teaches that superiors can make exceptions to monastic vows, how much less are such monastic vows in force that are contrary to God's commandments? Right? So we say, first of all, our beef with vows, with monastic vows, is uh, that they preclude those who take vows from being married. Right? Whereas God says that if somebody uh, is not able to, to remain uh, free of temptation of sexual immorality, they should be married. No exception. All right? uh, and that this is actually built into human nature. You know, the desire to marry and have children, that's, that's actually built into us uh, with some special exceptions. You know? uh, and if somebody has this special gift of God to remain chaste in thought and word and deed, fine. But insofar as most people can't, uh, they should get married. Right? Then they say, uh, you know, you can praise these monastic vows as much as you want, but vows cannot undo the commandment of God. Right? Paragraph 24. If, in fact, an obligation to a monastic vow could never be changed for any reason, the Roman popes could never have granted exceptions to the vows. For it is not lawful for someone to make an exception to what is truly from God. The Roman pontiffs have wisely judged that mercy is to be observed in these monastic obligations. That is why we read that many times they have made special arrangements and exceptions with monastic vows. The case of the king of Aragon, who was called back from the monastery, is well known. And there are other also examples in our own times. Right? So they're saying uh, there have been exceptions to the rule before you know, about monks being married. So the king of Aragon was in a uh, monastery and he was called back uh, to be king and presumably uh, became married. You know, so the popes have made exemptions before, but should we re be really making exemptions to things that God commands? Right? You know, so they're making exemptions to the vows because the vows go against what God commands. That's what they're saying there. And if a vow goes against what God commands, Maybe it's not a good vow, is, is what they're getting at. In the second place, why do our adversaries exaggerate the obligation or effect of a vow when, at the same time, they do not have anything to say about the nature of the vow itself? A vow should be something that is possible. It should be a decision that is made freely and after careful deliberation. We all know how possible perpetual chastity actually is in reality, and just how few people actually do take this vow freely and deliberately. Young women and men, before they are able to make their own decision about this, are persuaded, and sometimes even forced, to take the vow of chastity. Therefore, it is not fair to insist so rigorously on the obligation. Everyone knows that taking a vow that is not made freely and deliberately is against the very nature of a true vow. Right? So they're saying, then when we talk about vows, nobody really talks about what that means. And, and particularly with the, with the vow of chastity, we have young men and women being made to take these vows who really shouldn't have them. And then we don't release them. Instead, we just hold them to this obligation and see what evil fruit we can reap from that. Right? 31. Most canonical laws overturn vows made before the age of 15. Before that age, a person does not seem able to make wise judgment and to decide to make a lifelong commitment like this. Uh, parents, this is true, right? Uh, children don't make wise decisions before they're 15, and sometimes after that, right? There is another canon law that adds even more years to this limit showing that the vow of chastity should not be made before the age of 18. So which of these two canon laws should we follow? Most people leaving the monastery have a valid excuse since they took their vows before they were 15 or 18. So they say, uh, canon law, one canon law says you can't take vows till you're 15. One canon law says you can't take vows till you're 18. Which is it? And then many of the people who are leaving the monastery, well, 
whichever of those is the true one, they still took their vows before that, right? So even by canon law, these people should not be there. Finally, even though it might be possible con to condemn a person who breaks a vow, it does not follow that it is right to dissolve such a person's marriage. Augustine denies that they ought to be dissolved. Augustine's authority should not be taken lightly, even though some wish to do so today. Excuse me. Although it appears that God's command about marriage delivers many from their vows, our teachers introduce another argument about vows to show that they are void. Every service of God, established and chosen by people to merit justification and grace without God's commandment, is wicked. Christ says in Matthew 15, In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Paul teaches everywhere that righteousness is not to be sought in self-chosen practices and acts of worship devised by people. Righteousness comes by faith to those who believe that they are received by God into grace for Christ's sake, which is almost verbatim Article 4 that we read a ways back. Right? So they say, canon law shows us that if you would just listen to canon law, these monastic vows are all... Crazy things are being done with these monastic vows. But we have a better argument against monastic vows, and it's this. Any self-invented tradition or service uh, that is invented to merit righteousness is stupid. <laughs> it's the same argument again. They're like, you know, we can talk about canon law and all that, but here's a better argument. If there's a tradition or a work or some service invented by man with the purpose of meriting righteousness, my head will explode. You know, they keep saying it over and over again, right? That all this stuff that is invented to merit righteousness is worthless. Monastic vows are worthless, they would say here, because people were taking these vows hoping that they would become righteous on account of these vows, which is not how it works not how it works. You're made righteous by faith, right? It is clear for all, oh, we'll just do 38 through 40. It is clear for all to see that the monks have taught that services made up by people make satisfaction for sins and merit grace and justification. What else is this than distracting from detracting from Christ's glory and hiding and denying the righteousness that comes through faith. Therefore, it follows that monastic vows which have been widely taken are wicked services of God and consequently are void. For a wicked vow taken against God's commandment is not valid. For, as canon law says, no vow ought to bind people to wickedness. So using canon law. We'll pick up here next week, and then we'll get to talk about church authority. We'll talk about the kingdom of the right and the kingdom of the left uh, next week. Uh, are there any questions before we end with prayer? And then I'll turn off the live stream and stick around for a second if you can, and I'll talk about why I was missing last week and why that will happen again at some point here. Uh, any questions before we, we close with a prayer? All right. Uh, let us pray. Gracious Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gifts that you so freely give us, uh, the gifts of life and salvation through your Son, Jesus Christ, and especially the opportunity to be here again this morning to, to study your word as present here in the Augsburg Confession. We must confess, Lord, that the devil is going around like a prowling lion seeking to uh, devour us, to tempt us away to works righteousness of various forms. And we ask that by your Holy Spirit, uh, we would be defended from these temptations, that any attempt of our own to merit righteousness or forgiveness from you uh, would be cast far away from our minds, and that we would hold solely to the righteousness that is by faith in your Son. Be with us this day and grant us again your Holy Spirit, that what we say and do may please you, be pleasing in your sight. In your name we pray. Amen.